Thank you for joining us on the Real Religion Podcast today, where a rabbi and a reverend walk into a podcast and talk real about religion. Joel, good afternoon. <laughs> Howdy, Eric. How are you today? I'm wonderful. I'm just really glad that we didn't pass over this week's episode. <laughs> Boy, we're we're like twelve seconds into it, and you're already teasing the theme of the week. I've, just all week, I, I've been waiting to use that horrible pun, and so I, I finally had the chance. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I I am assuming, like for us, this is a busy season, and I'm assuming that for you, it is equally busy. It is. Yes, it is. One hundred percent. So have you been to the grocery store or the farmer's market and gotten all the necessary ingredients? No, but that's because um, uh, different people are in charge of the cooking. I am blessedly only in charge. I put only in quotes because it is a big job, but I am only in charge of the actual Seder and service. And so uh, Emily and I uh, have, a, have, have a pretty good system each year and um, in years past, I, have you been to our house for Passover, Joel? No. When you lived here? No. I don't remember if you and, and uh, you didn't, because I think the one year we wanted you to come, it was Easter, if memory serves. <laughs> that would um, explain a lot. <laughs> that would explain why you couldn't come. Um, but we typically have between 40 and 50 people over and do all sorts of kind of creative, what we think is creative, fun stuff. And of course, um, last year, there, it was nothing. I think it was the two of us. This year, we're... Uh, thankful we have both sets of grandparents and of course our son um but next year we'll back to our we'll be back to our usual ruckus nice and listeners if you can't tell already we're going to spend this episode focusing on passover that uh, that holiday that remembers so many things that so much of america and even american christians forget about uh, we're going to let uh, Rabbi Eric take the lead for mo most of this, and I'm going to interview him and push back and challenge and wonder and question, uh, but we're going to try to unpack this scary, amazing, beautiful, <laughs> ancient ritual of God's action, God's instruction to pass over certain households uh, so that they could be led towards freedom. That is a quick nutshell, and I am not the right person in this conversation to be <laughs> nutshelling this. So uh, let's get started with the deeper definitions and imaginations of Passover. All right, and hopefully uh, my explanations won't take as long as a Passover Seder, uh, which is anywhere between, you know, it can be six, seven hours long in some households. But uh, I'll try to do a quick and interesting uh, synopsis. Like, like you said, Joel, I mean, the, the quote unquote basic Passover story is a very familiar one. And the, the way I've best heard it expressed is in a first person form, because I think it, it makes the story that much more resonant and relevant, um, which are the, the word relevant is, is a word I apply to Passover often. And that is, I was a slave and God set me free. And the biblical source of this is, of course, Exodus, starting with God hearing the Israelites' cries. And um, Moses has this theophany, this encounter with God at the burning bush. Uh, Moses becomes the leader of the, of the Israelites. Uh, God sends 10 plagues to the Egyptians, which I, I have a feeling we're going to talk about because you brought a very interesting question up uh, prior to the show, Joel. And uh, after those 10 plagues, after those ten plagues that uh, wreak destruction upon the Egyptian and upon the Egyptians and the land of Egypt, Pharaoh finally says, "Get out of here, go." Uh, the the Israelites leave, and they're in. They're so excited to leave, and they're in such a rush because they're also afraid that Pharaoh is going to come after them, which he of course does. That as they leave, they don't uh, have time to bake their bread, and so the bread doesn't rise. It is what we now call matzah. And that's one of the major symbols we have during Passover. In fact, so much so uh, that we don't eat bread for the full week of Passover. And then, of course, as uh, Exodus says, uh, the Israelites march, the Egyptians catch them at the Red Sea. 
God splits the waters of the Red Sea. Uh, the Israelites walk through to freedom. The Egyptians drown. Uh, and eventually that's the beginning of our march toward freedom, toward Torah, toward the land of milk and honey. There is so much there. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me begin by saying that it is the most widely um, uh, attended holiday for Jews in America, regardless of denomination, regardless of uh, uh, adherence to Jewish law. And I think it is because Passover becomes this holiday, as, and most Jewish holidays, and I would think most religious holidays, aim to do this. But Passover is really the prime example of where it succeeds, which is to blend a historical moment. And of course, that's whether or not one actually believes it's true. We, we have already talked about that before, but, but it is a story of history. To blend that with a personal spiritual experience. And there's a statement in the Mishnah from around the, the third century that says the main goal of Passover is that one should act as if he himself, a person themselves, left Egypt. So it's not just a story about my ancestors, it's a story about me. And to get a little bit, um, I hate using the word deep, but of course I'm going to use it, to get a little bit deeper here, the word Egypt in Hebrew for the country Egypt is Mitzrayim, which uh, if we have any Hebrew biblical scholars out there, actually, Joel, you may know this. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but uh, Mitzrayim is a conjunction of three things, me, Tsar, and Im. Me in Hebrew means from. Im is a plural ending. So we have from something plural, Tsar means a narrow place. And so Mitzrayim is from the narrow places, and that's what we exited from. And so there's lots of metaphor, teaching, sermon, uh, but really just th individual thoughtfulness about what are your narrow places? What do you need to escape from? Not physically, God forbid. Um, and one of the things we do in the Seder is we talk about the 10 plagues that happened in Egypt, but we also sometimes go around the table and say, what's a plague in our society? And, you know, other than the obvious COVID, which hopefully we're, we're exiting from that narrow place, um, you know, we're recording this just a few days after the incredibly horrible shooting in Colorado. So America's relationship to guns, I would say, is a modern day plague. And I, I, I speak about this to to say how Passover has this very connective way of bringing us to our modern lives and not only uh, about the past. And it's the one holiday for which there is very much a specific order of prayers. And this is one of the last things I'll say, Joel, before uh, you kind of ask some interesting questions here. Actually, two things to say. Um and Seder means order. What we do at, at someone's house is have a Seder. And so there is a very particular prescribed order to the service. But within each part of that, there is so much room for creativity, for discussion, for activity, for fun. Um, and as a matter of fact, the Talmud says, this is the second thing I was going to say, and it's re in re it, uh got brought to my mind, Joel, when you said, you know, you're going to ask me questions. One of the main goals of Passover from the rabbis writing the Talmud in the Hellenic period is to do things differently than on a normal night. And there's a part of the service where one sings uh, what's called the four questions. And the main question is, Manish Tanaha Laila Hazeh. How is this night different than all other nights? And there are four prescribed answers. On all other nights, we don't typically eat matzah. On all other nights, we don't lean to the left. Tonight, we lean, and that's because leaning is a sign of freedom, so on and so forth. You could look those up uh, if you want to. I'll actually put those in the show notes. Um, but what's more meaningful is the idea that at your own Seder or wherever one goes for a Seder, you come up with your own answers. And the Talmud has this beautiful expression that you do things differently on Passover so that the children should ask. And so it really becomes a way of lifting up what does it mean to be Jewish? What does it mean to have a Jewish identity? All these things and not 
only, and I put only in air quotes because it's a huge story in and of itself, but not only the actual exodus from Egypt. So I'll stop there, maybe take a breath and uh, <laughs> let me know where you want to go from there. This happens to clergy a lot. We know our stuff. It means a lot to us. We've made so many different connections. We've studied the stories. We've uh, we've embodied and enfleshed those stories with and for others in so many different ways. And we've made connections from different chunks of the grand stories of, of our faiths to things that are going on in our world. In other words, we're so inside our own faith, that it's exciting and we get passionate about it, like you've been doing here for these last few minutes. But I do want to slow you down, back you up. And and while I am uh, a, a student of Bible, there's a lot of stuff going on in there that we better unpack for, her, for our uh, listeners so that they can see all the pieces. When you celebrate Passover, the Seder meal, uh, that is celebrating from what in the story to what in the story. Right. So it's not a simple answer because the way Passover is mentioned in, in the Torah, in, in the Bible, uh, it, the holiday Pesach. And some people translate it the way you did, Joel, as the angel of death passing over the Jewish homes because they had the lamb's blood on their doorposts. Another translation is that God, it wasn't a passive passed over. It was an active pr protection. So it's a slight semantic difference, but I do think there it's an important difference. But the, the main answer is that what we celebrate as our Passover in the 20th century is not really the, the source of that is not really the Bible story. The source of that is the Talmud and how they kind of created this order of things to do. Um, because in the Bible, it, it's really more about ritual that you, you um, will eat matzah and you'll remember that God Pesach, God passed over or protected us. Uh, it, it's not kind of an eight day holiday. And actually the Passover, as we celebrate it in modern times, looks a lot more like a Greek symposia with people talking, debating, asking questions. You're eating at different times. It's a longer experience. Um, but, but ultimately, it celebrates the entire story from being slaves, the Pharaoh not knowing Joseph, to uh, some people would say the... Um, Splitting of the Red Sea, I would say the giving of Torah on Mount Sinai. Okay, that's helpful. That's deep into the story uh, from before slavery, really. But when the impetus of the new Pharaoh started looking at these people and thinking, hmm, I could take advantage of them to those people at the base of Sinai receiving the early commandments. You're, you're saying some say, including you, that it extends that much. The Passover name, though, it comes from the tenth plague. What about the other nine? Why? Where are those? Are those celebrated in these rituals? And why didn't they work? Why did it take the tenth uh, Passover plague uh, to to set Israel's hearts a little so, um, to Egypt's hearts soft enough to release the people of Israel? So that, Joel, is the, um, that's the million dollar question. And, and, I, I, and I'm not, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm serious. It, it is, for anyone that takes the Bible seriously, regardless of whether you believe, again, it's true, it is highly problematic because, um, and, and I, I know you know this, but our, our listeners may not be aware that there are a few times after God does a few plagues, that God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And so God, Pharaoh's heart being hardened causes him to say no. When, I mean, we all know the song, let my people go. You know, Moses goes with his brother Aaron, tells, asks Pharaoh, beseeches Pharaoh to let the people go. And, and Pharaoh says no. And, and it's 
possibly an abrogation of free will. It's divine intervention that's getting in the way of, of being able to make a moral or for that matter, an immoral choice. It's highly problematic. I will, um, I'm not going to get into that so much, but I will say that um, the way the rabbis handle it, and it is a little bit of a cop-out, but, but there's, there's really nothing you can do that wouldn't be a cop-out, but um, is that when someone is so evil or so dead set on something, it's really that he, he was hardening his own heart, which of course is not what the text says. And, you know, the, the, without question, there's a debate there. Um, but uh, but it is something that we struggle with, and and that's not we as liberal reform Jews. That's that's all Jews struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the previous nine plagues are pretty bad. They they do some damage to the economy and the infrastructure of Egypt. It's the the bloody river and the frogs and the locusts and and there's some pretty rough stuff that can really disrupt the luxurious life of the Egyptian slave owners. But I, I've preached this text once before, and I'd be curious to know what your perception is. The 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, is the only one that gets personal. It's the first plague of the 10 that isn't affecting the system or the structures of Egypt, where if you have enough power and money, like Pharaoh did, you can... You can survive that. You can wait that out. But well, it does affect the system in that there's no heir. You know, by Pharaoh's son dying, nice. then there's there's. No, but um, but that one hits home and gets in his own household in an unavoidable way that he can't just oh, wait sure. out. So that's uh, that's been my sermon, and it I used it one time with I had a, a person who was quite sure that homosexuality was a sin but had a son who came out as gay and to watch that person transform and uh, and the heart soften and to start seeing the world through different eyes that 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 was a beautiful transformation and i likened it to um the the hard heart versus the ah, the beautiful. zap that finally released the hardness You, you do ask a question that uh, reminds me of one of my favorite Bible lectures when I was uh, uh, in rabbinical school. And our Bible professor started with what seems like a simple question. Who is the audience for the plagues? The way we read it, and even the way you frame the question, like, why don't the plagues work? The audience seems to be Pharaoh and the Egyptians. I'm going to perform these plagues so that Pharaoh... They are going to happen to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And so Pharaoh will um, then let the Israelites out. But as you notice, and many people notice, that there, that's a feel that's theologically problematic because then God is possibly incurring undue or unnecessary evil, hurt, tragedy on the Egyptian people. And so one way to possibly reframe it, and it doesn't make that suffering or pain of the Egyptian people any easier, but it does make sense from a different standpoint, is that, in fact, it's not the Egyptians who are the audience, it's the Israelites who are the audience, so that they can witness God's full power and then only worship that one God and to see the ridiculousness of many gods and idols and, and the system that monotheism completely pushes back on. And because if God uh, turned the Nile into blood, it's funny because the, um, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, you know, the famous movie uh, by C.C. B. DeMille comes out on Blu-ray in, in like three days. So I've been, I'm so, and of course I have it pre-ordered. Um, and I'm so excited to, <laughs> to watch it again. <laughs> right. um, but hopefully some of our listeners are old enough to know that movie as well as The Prince of Egypt, which are both worth watching uh, without question. Um, but anyway, if God, if God only turned the river into blood and Pharaoh said, oh, my goodness, you're destroying our entire economy. We can't fish. We can't 
you know, sell food anymore, get the Jews out of here. That would have accomplished the Jews leaving Egypt, but it would not have accomplished the Jews seeing the full might of this God that's saving them. And so, you know, it's not a fully um, yeah, comforting answer, but but it, it makes a little more sense. Okay. I, I've perceived that the audience of the plagues, there's three tiers, and there's clearly the leadership, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's court. There's clearly the preferred people of leadership, the standard everyday Egyptians. And then there's the oppressed people of leadership, the slaves, the people of Israel. And those three zones, the leadership, the preferred, the oppressed, they are all the audience of the same action. And and that's where I, I look for God actions to be one action condemns leadership, uh, causes the preferred people to question and gives reassurance and hope to the oppressed. When something in our world does that, I, it might be God. And it's a passover moment to me. So if it makes uh, an evil dictator upset, if it makes the dictator's preferred people upset and the people they're oppressing start to get some energy and celebrate and protest more lively in the streets. I think of that as a God moment, but I've never really, and you can tell me, is Passover a social justice holiday for you? Oh, I, I would say it is the social justice holiday. So, um, and this is, this is kind of what I was alluding to with regard to um, the creativity and the the bringing in of modern day themes. So um, there are various, for example, so Haggadah is the prayer book we use during Passover. It's called, and it literally translates to the story and lots of people make their own. Some people collect them that have been published. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands of them. And many of them are specifically for a cause. I mean, I've seen a gun control Haggadah. There's many, um, women's rights Haggadahs. There's a, a Holocaust survivor Haggadah. Um, and then there's some fun ones. Like I, I've seen one that are, that uh, relate to the musical Hamilton. I've seen ones that relate specifically to baseball. And, and there's ways to tease out all the themes of Passover by doing that. But, um, you know, one of the standard lines in the Haggadah is let all who are hungry come and eat. And you know, being hospitable to strangers is a, a a mitzvah, a law in Judaism, but all the more so during Passover. And Passover is the uh, holiday where one is supposed to invite people to their home that perhaps they've never met before, they don't know, um, and and there really is a custom of doing that. And and so that brings in kind of a sense of justice and equality and sharing. Um, it's. I would say it's always been a holiday that appreciates the immigrant experience. Um, certainly in the last eight years, I think that has uh, been exacerbated, especially with some of the horrible policies. I was thinking about like, do I say horrible policies? Yes, horrible policies um, that we've had, certainly the last four. Um, the, there's an organization, Highest, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, that um, that works toward uh, the kindness with regard to immigrant policies. And every year they publish insert readings for Passover that allude to the rights of immigrants and being a stranger and that sort of thing. And so, I mean, I, I can't amplify your question enough, Joel. <laughs> It feels like that would um, be so appropriate. And I have heard that each family, while the core markers of the Passover celebration are not just similar, identical across the Passover celebration, there's so much room for interpretation and flexibility and embodiment of that in each household or synagogue or temple so that it can focus on what, what that celebrating community considers its plague that it is looking for freedom from or its issue that it is looking to address uh, God's power into. Absolutely.
I've seen the uh, pictures, and maybe others have as well, of the special plate, often divided with uh, spaces or glaze or something, and little symbols on certain zones of the plate and different materials on the plate. Um, tell me about that symbol and what's what's on the plate, and what are the other key symbols of the Passover celebration? Yeah. And this is another thing that kind of makes Passover unique in, in the panoply of Jewish holidays is is the sensory you know experience to a degree. So um, we dip. I'll just kind of name a few yep. as I think of them. We dip vegetables into salt water to remind us of the tears of slavery. We eat maror horseradish uh, to remind us of the bitterness of slavery. Uh, we eat, and every person who makes this has their own recipe. Uh, we call it harosed. It's like raisins and dates and it's almost like a it, it has a consistency of a paste it's very sweet uh, apples are usually in it maybe some cinnamon and that's supposed to be reminiscent of the the cement the glue that um you know the, the when the israelites were building pyramids or you know structures the glue between you know the rocks and so um uh, there's an egg on the Seder plate that uh, symbolizes spring and rebirth. Passover, of course, is always in the spring. And so there, there's uh, all these symbols. And and that, too, points to, uh, and I wouldn't have thought of this, Joel, had you not asked, so thank you. Um, pe some people put new symbols on a Seder plate, too. So about uh, 20 years ago, it became somewhat customary, especially in liberal circles, to put an orange on the Seder plate. And uh, the apocryphal story that I heard that I don't think is actually true, but it doesn't need to be, is that um, someone was talking about women being rabbis. And then a another person said, yeah, women will be rabbis when an orange belongs on the Seder plate. <laughs> and so it's, a, it, it's basically a reminder to us that women are rabbis and times do thankfully change and things can get better. And so, again, using modern symbols in addition to the tradition, traditional. Do I remember a small bone with some meat also on a Seder plate? Yep. So that's the Pascha. That represents the Pascha lamb, the animal that was sacrificed before painting the blood on the doorposts. Great. What what else? Is there anything of something about the hip joint? Is that one in there as well? No. Well, the other big one is matzah. Okay. Um, Unleavened then, bread. Uh, it, unyeasted bread. Correct. And it's even during Passover, we call it, this goes back to the, the social justice, we call it the bread of affliction. Um, and so there's all these references to, uh, certainly I try to link the freedom, our freedom, whether it be as Jews, as Americans, as privileged people to help be a catalyst for the freedom of others. Because ultimately, if we're only sitting in our homes having a delicious meal with friends and family, I mean, that's wonderful. And we should all have as many of those experiences and memories as possible. But even that is not enough. The, 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 what makes it, to me, a religious and holy experience is using that as inspiration to bring about the freedom of others. As Exodus tells us time and time again, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That act of remembering is not a passive mental exercise. It's an active way of being in the world. When I think of the the core commandment of Judaism, I don't think of the Ten Commandments. I think of that one. Remember, you were slaves in Egypt, therefore. And and those kind of statements, uh, that's where, to me, if you're going to, like, oh, no, I'm forgetting I'm Jewish. Oh, no, I'm forgetting the reason that I am connected to all my brothers and sisters of the people of Israel that's how, that is the core of the connection. For me, it's that critical point. Remember, you uh, were slaves in Egypt. And, and I imagine you have uh, people of the Jewish faith now who go, no, I wasn't. I wasn't there. I was never a slave. <laughs> and well, the, that's the point of these rituals and these moments is to say, yes, you were. You definitely were. 100%. There. And if I could share just one more kind of brief, uh, I don't want to say a brief lecture, but <laughs> Come a, on. A, a, a brief pontification is 
Uh, one of the things we do at the Seder, I mentioned this four questions thing. Um, there's also something that describes traditionally the four sons. We call it now the four children. And so there's this idea that there's the wise, the wicked, the simple, and the child that doesn't know how to ask. And the point of that in the Seder and as written in the Haggadah is that, the, and again, the father is the one teaching, um, you know, traditionally, but that depending on what kind of child you are, or to put it in a more modern framework, depending on what kind of learner one is, the teacher says different things. And, um, and you, anyone who's interested, Google the four children Passover. You'll find all sorts of things on this. I have a dear friend who actually did his um, rabbinic thesis on this as educational pedagogy. Of, I mean, this is what education is all about. We teach to the student. We don't just teach at, without regard for who the student is and what they're qualified to do and their personality and all that sort of thing. And what the wicked son in the Haggadah asks, because each of the um, kids has a question except for the simple child that doesn't know how to ask. Or, Sorry, simple is different than the one who doesn't know how to ask. The wicked child, the, the wickedest thing that one asks during Passover is, what's so important about this story that happened to them? Like that's the big crime is to only think it happened to them and not to us or to me. Off topic, but still on the number four, another thing we do on Passover, this is possibly what makes it such a fun experience, is we drink uh, formally four cups of wine. Uh, and it, those are spaced out throughout the service, um, where we say four blessings, one for each cup. And the reason for that is there are four synonyms um, within a few verses of Exodus for God freeing us. And so we take each of those four as kind of a, a, a reason to celebrate. And there's lots of other things like that. We don't have time to go into it, but you can see the depth of what this holiday brings out in us and also what we bring to it. Is there a reflection in the Passover for the whining that takes place uh, about, oh my gosh, you brought us out here to kill us. We'll never find any water. And then there's water. Oh my gosh, you brought us out here to starve us to death. And then there's bread from heaven, manna. Oh my gosh, you brought us out here and, and we'll never eat a healthy meal again. We should hurry back to the flesh pots of Egypt. And then there's quail. Is there space for for the whiners in Passover and a co like confessional slash remembrance yeah. of that? That's a great question, and not really because the the certainly the biblical text, as, as we talked about, it kind of ends with the the splitting of the sea. But one thing that I think does tie into this is uh, at one point in the seder we sing a song called Dayenu, which means it would have been enough, and it lists. Uh, the, and again, people make up their own also, as I'm going to be doing in my own seders. Um, but we list miracles that God did for us. And then the idea is, even if God only did this, it would have been enough. But God didn't only do that. God also did this. And even if God only did that. And so an example is, if God only gave us Shabbat, that would be enough. If God only gave us Torah, that would have been enough. If God freed us from Egypt, that would have been enough. But, you know, of course, after God freed up freed us from Egypt, God gave us the manna, as you just mentioned, and that would have been enough. And so it's like one thing after another. One of the, speaking of social justice, one of the things I do with that, and I didn't make this up, um, but is turn it on its head, which is sometimes, uh, again, and bringing it back to our lives, is some things aren't enough. In other words, the, the theme, and now I'm preaching a little bit, but you know, that expression of dayenu, like we're not there yet. That's a to me. That's kind of a messianic hope, and I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about an actual Messiah. I'm talking about what we should strive to bring. And so, um, you know, when like one example, when we can have gun control, reasonable gun control in America, Dayenu, when we can um, truly see the humanity of Palestinians and Israelis hopefully living together, Dayenu. Think, so it kind of turns it on its head a little bit. 
which isn't exactly your question, but I think it does speak to it. No, it's great. And I wonder, like one of the, um, I was asked during seminary because I was taking Hebrew to help co-lead a uh, a Seder meal for the Presbyterian church because they had an interfaith couple where he was Jewish and the the wife was Christian and they were raising their daughters in both faiths. Uh, But I was also at that same time going to our Presbyterian General Assembly, which is the the highest meeting of all of our uh, churches and presbyteries. And I had been put on the, the, quote, peacemaking committee and assigned to study the Israel-Palestine issue. So I had been reading thousands of pages and watching videos and studying and reading. And and I knew some about it, but I was learning a lot. And then I went to this Passover meal and I thought, there's an irony here that in this season of Passover— we are celebrating freedom of an oppressed people. Meanwhile, just as Israel, the nation, not the people or the faith, but Israel, the current nation, is oppressing their neighbors. And surely those who are in Israel celebrate the Passover and see the hypocrisy of this as they are looking up more and more like Pharaoh the farther these settlements reach into the Palestinian uh, olive groves. Uh, and I wondered if if something like that ever arises in the Jewish conversation, like, oh, no, in the celebration of Passover, there's an oh, no moment. We, we are forgetting that we were once well, the slaves. Yeah, I mean, my answer to that, again, is, is something that, that is in the Haggadah, which I don't know how, you know how many of us actually live. I mean, it's one of those stories that if we really took it seriously, we talked about this last week a little bit, um, it would just stop us in our tracks. And that is when the Egyptians drowned, when the waters of the Red Sea, and again, I'm picturing the movie, when the waters of the Red Sea come in and the Israelites are safe on the other side— and the Egyptians are in the middle of the Red Sea and drown and die. The Israelites are singing a song called Micha Mocha, which we sing at almost any prayer service. I mean, you've heard it at our temple, Joel, without question. Um, it's every Friday night, every Saturday morning. And it's the song that Miriam led us in when we started walking through the Red Sea. And then and they're and they're still singing. That's the idea. They're still singing. And, you know, I mean, think about it. You've been slaves for over 400 years and now you're exiting to freedom through this huge miracle. I mean, you, you better sing. right? And God says now this is a Midrash. Um, it's not in the Bible, but um, it's something I think that uh, we take seriously or that we should take seriously. How can you be singing when my children are drowning? And of course, my children is the Egyptians. And talk about irony. The the reason that they died is because of their enslavement. And yet God and God is the catalyst for the freedom. And yet even God is saying, don't rejoice at the pain of your enemy. And I there's a lot there that, again, if we took seriously, I think would just stop us in our tracks. This helps me begin to unpack this uh, Passover, this festival of unleavened bread. In some of the New Testament Gospels, that's what it's called. And we're beginning to approach uh, this coming Sunday will be Palm Sunday, where Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time. And then Thursday is a special service in a lot of Christian churches called Maundy Thursday. Um, And it's not... Mondi comes from uh, the Latin mandate to a command um, where he gives us a command about the Lord's Supper. And the assumption of uh, a lot of people from the Lord's Supper is he sends his disciples to an upper room to prepare the Passover meal. the That special celebration of symbols and readings and, and things. Uh, this is, a lot of this is, might be you know, around the time where Talmud was getting perfected, even. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on the timing of it. But in the Easter story, 
Passover is essential um, for this Palestinian Jew. He celebrated the Passover. It was critical to him. And even at his most dangerous time where he enters Jerusalem and he sees his people oppressed uh, in a different way by the religious professionals and the Roman government, uh, he imagines the power of God passing over them and freeing them in some new way. So whatever this story was, its meaning and significance meant a lot to Jesus of Nazareth. And and so it means a lot to me. And and I, I love uh, that you're teaching me and others about it today. Well, and Joel, I think you gave a, a perfect link to that. that for, first of all, a reminder that you know, these two holidays, namely Passover and Easter, not only are they um, very highly observed by, by our, our various uh, flocks, as it were, but, but they're incredibly powerful holidays. I mean, you know, Hanukkah is, in America is very observed either, but that, that's a fairly minor holiday. Um, but, you know, to my knowledge, Easter is foundational. And certainly for for Christianity and, and Passover is certainly that way for Judaism. And um, as Easter is, uh, it's a week from this coming Sunday. Am I right? Yeah. So it's Palm Sunday, and then it starts what is called Holy Week. Uh, and in some traditions, every day of the week from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday is special. But in a lot of these, uh, a lot of mainline congregations they'll they've trimmed that down to where there's really just Monday Thursday and Good Friday holy Saturday the the Sabbath where he was buried and then Sunday the renewal the resurrection um b- but then again there are a lot of Christian churches who they don't do palms they don't do Monday Thursday they they don't do Good Friday. In fact, there are churches around me that are advertising Easter services starting Friday. You know, and I'm like, that is messed up, y'all. You you got to let him die before you re- before you start celebrating him being <laughs> risen again. Just how did y'all skip over the death part and the and the the trouble part and the the meal in the upper room part and the betrayal of the disciples part? How did y'all skip all that? Uh, I just go straight to the party. I it always frustrates me when Christians do that. <laughs> uh, Joe, I, I love hearing you talk about um, what frustrates you about Christian. I mean, I I, <laughs> I I actually should do more of what because there's plenty about Judaism that frustrates me. Certainly, in a much more um, halakhic, you know, according to Jewish law, especially with regard to kind of sexism and homophobia. But uh, I always appreciate your um, your thoughts on things like I that. get nervous when Christians start to think about Passover because we'll like we'll do uh, some people call it Lord's Supper, some call it Eucharist, some call it communion, and it's all connected to Passover people. Like so, you really need to know Passover to do what we do well, um, and it's why I so loved inviting you to co-preach with me on World Communion Sunday. I I can't do communion <laughs> until I understand what Jesus was doing at the Passover meal. Yeah, I, I will say it, it is a tricky thing for uh, for Jews sometimes when they're it, it, it's fairly common um, for Jews and rabbis, cantors to be asked to lead Passover seders for some Christian communities. And it's a tricky thing because for us as Jews um, and, you know, I, I'm not telling anyone how to feel or anything. I'm just kind of sharing my perspective or, or as you would like, or, or you love to hear, Joel, I'm sharing my truth. Thanks. <laughs> I know, I know yeah, you love that's, that expression. that's just great. My skin is crawling off yeah. my body at this point. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, um, Christian communities having Passover in a manner that I would pa- have Passover is a sort of co-opting that makes, makes me a little bit uneasy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, what I am comfortable doing, and quite frankly, what I enjoy doing is teaching about Passover 
to non-Jews because it's such a it's such a universal story. Any everyone can either relate or appreciate the story of injustice and slavery from moving from slavery to freedom. Um, but it is quintessentially for me a Jewish and exclusively Jewish story. I mean, the specificity of it is Jewish. And so, whereas I'm more than happy to teach Passover and to teach Judaism. I am hesitant to lead a Passover Seder as a religious experience for a non-Jewish community. Um, and, and there is some tension there sometimes between um, some, uh, com some Christian communities and some Jewish communities in, in that, because sometimes that, that tension is not understood. It's like, well, why, why wouldn't you lead a Passover Seder? Mm -hmm. I, I can see that. Uh, and I'm not going to push back on that. That's, that makes sense. Uh, and there are a lot of Christians, uh, pastors, who stand behind the Lord's table and break the bread and pour the cup and explain it and then will not offer it to certain people in that worshiping congregation if they don't think that they are baptized believers. Uh, I don't play that. Uh, it's not my table, I say. This is the Lord's table and all who are hungry are welcome here. And that comes from the, probably the Christian understanding that Jesus' disciples weren't all Jewish. Some of them had odd names like Andrew or Philip. Uh, those those were Greekies, right? What are y'all doing here? Right. But Jesus went in that upper room and prepared the Passover and trained them in it and did it with them. And then gave them a new command. Whenever y'all do this, remember me. Um, so... So for me, if I was to ever invite a, a Jewish leader or person to to teach us about it, I would want them to, they don't have to think of it as the Passover, which they would only do with their, with their community. I would still want them to walk us through the language, the songs, and the symbols so that we could, not so that we could co-opt it, but so we could surrender to it. And, and let it be our guide into knowing Jesus better. Oh, absolutely. And, and um, I'm glad you expounded on that a little bit because, the, I, first of all, I wish we were neighbors again because <laughs> I would love to do that for your community. Hey, look on my right, look um, on my arm. Can you see it? Oh yeah, how are you? Yeah, I saw that. Mazel tov. I know. I got I got hit today with dose one of the Pfizer. I I love that my band aid is red, so I'm hoping that this is a sign that God should pass over me and not uh, <laughs> sick the COVID plague upon me and my household. Well, next week I think we'll we'll talk about Easter. I'm looking forward to that, and uh, always good talking with you, Joel, and uh, to all our listeners, shalom. Thank you for joining us on the Real Religion Podcast today, where a rabbi and a reverend walk into a podcast and talk real about religion. I'm Reverend Joel Talbert, and on behalf of Rabbi Eric Linder and all the Real Religion fans out there, we thank you for being with us today and invite you to send us any feedback or suggestions or topic ideas to realreligionpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, keep it real.